Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Those of you who are online watching this live, thank you for joining us. Uh, those of you who will be seeing this at some point in the future, the wonders of technology, uh, thank you for, uh, for finding us on the web. Um, a couple words about uh, Science Sunday, and we're, uh, we're normally in front of a live audience. Today our audience is fairly significantly truncated, um, but we're still here for you, and we're here to, to uh, uh, spread the joy and awe and wonder and delights of science, which has been our mission for several years now. Um, this program started in 2012 as a forum to provide this church and the local community with information about science. It's also become a community of science lovers who delight in the wonders of our universe, from the nuclei of atoms and cells to the functioning of biological creatures and systems, and even explorations of distant stars and planets and ideas of all sorts about nature. Unitarian Universalism, which is the host of this program, uh, we get to use the facilities here, and um, many of us are members of this church of Unitarian Universalism here in DuPage. Um, it has as one of its principles the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Now, most of us share the conviction that natural science provides us all as individuals and as societies with the very best factual basis for deciding what is real and possible in the world. Some of us go further and assert that knowledge of the real universe is the only viable path towards a better understanding of one another, of our impact on the planet, and of our relationship to the wider cosmos. A responsible search, in our view, requires the skills of critical thinking and must involve a means of separating truth from fiction. For us, the methods of science are the best means we have of doing that. Another principle of Unitarian Universalism bids us to pay attention to the interconnected web of existence. Your relationship to a cell or an atom and your relationship to the web of all life and the cycles of geology and chemistry and meteorology that sustain all life are several of the threads of this web, and they bind us to each other, to the things as desperate, uh, I'm sorry, as disparate as ocean plankton and the changing climate. Exploring how we relate to this web, how we can tug on it and vice versa, is key to our survival. We must seek to understand how our place in nature anchors us to the spectacular potential of our lives. We might discover that the extraordinary richness of reality can help give our lives meaning. These are key motivations for Science Sunday. This is your forum, your science-loving community, and it is enriched by your participation. If you have an idea you're passionate or knowledgeable about, we invite you to tell us about it and help us all learn something wonderful and new. Today, Mike Winter, will help us learn something wonderful about the making of the fittest. This discussion of this topic fits in well with the uh, um, many months long series of talks I've been giving about the way everything came into being. And now in my series of talks, we're up to the point of talking about evolution. And uh, next, uh, in, in a couple weeks, I'm gonna talk about the feedback between the evolution of life and the biosphere, and the geosphere, and the world, uh, the planet itself. Um, so talking about evolution and life, those are important topics in understanding where we came from and what allows us to be the way we are. And here to talk to us about that is my dear friend and co-host, Mike Winter. Wild applause. Wild applause. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Hello, science lovers, and thanks for being here today, if it is virtually. 
but nonetheless, I uh, welcome you in. I want you to know that uh, Jane and I are fine and hope all of you are as well. Scott reports that he's doing well too. I noticed that there were almost uh, 200 views on his talk about origins last week, so or three weeks ago, I mean. So it sure seems like we're filling a need here, and, uh, and that's a pretty uh, satisfying position to be in. I also wanted to give a note of thanks for all the nurses, doctors, hospital workers, and other people providing essential uh, services at this time. Kids, if you want to grow up and be a superhero, I think you've got some pretty great role models to follow right here. And science is involved with a lot of that as well, too. Uh, my brother Glenn is a doctor in New Orleans that's uh, suffering their issues right now. So a special shout out to him. He worked at County in Chicago for most of his career. And he certainly knows how to provide concerned care for those people in need. And uh, he may even be live streaming today. I invited him at least. So hopefully uh, everyone out there is safe and well. We send our good wishes and thank you for being here today. I'm coming to you today via the very talented members of the AV Committee here at DuPage UU Church. We're facing what has been a challenging week for our state and the country, and uh, with the likelihood that a few more are on the way. I'm thankful that the church has emphasized the importance of streaming Science Sunday to all interested parties and hope that the onset of warm weather and the hard efforts by so many to restrict their travel and restrict the transmission of this nasty virus will soon have positive impacts for us all. I originally planned to dive into the science behind the coronavirus outbreak today. I thought it could be helpful in dispelling some myths that uh, have arisen about it. Since I'm not a health professional, uh, I was very cautious of going down that path. And I worked to enlist the services of professionals from DuPage County. Uh, and there was not a lot of interest in, in coming out on that. So uh, I changed gears and had some sincere thought and a good deal of study. I felt there is a good deal of information out there, and I uh, encourage you to go find it, look into, the, into things on it, make sure you're finding facts and not uh, rumors. And my insights aren't really that deep or robust enough to put them out to this community just by myself without support. Uh, it has been really enlightening studying the topic in preparation for this, but I don't have the medical background to give you the information that you can count on, and I think I encourage you to go find it. I do want to say that this whole situation makes me feel like I'm 16 years old again. Gas is cheap, and most of us are grounded. <laughs> As a result, of all this, I decided to explore more deeply a topic I've talked about in prior Science Sundays, and that is the forensic proofs of evolution. What's out there scientifically that shows what we know to be true? I've used before takeoffs of one of science's most famous terms, the survival of the fittest. One adaptation might be the arrival of the fittest. There's a popular book by that name, and I did a Science Sunday based on that book a while ago, too because uh, the arrival of the fittest emphasizes the evolutionary paths by which more fit individuals come to be. Today, I titled this talk, The Making of the Fittest, since I aim to delve into genes, chromosomes, proteins, amino acids, and those structures, those components in living things that are the building blocks that make everything, all living things, what they have evolved to become. We will talk of immortal genes today, and we'll discuss fossil genes, both in ways you may never have heard discussed. On this journey, we will see that this method of becoming can only be if we realize the important contributions of change by natural selection. In short, our own bodies contain some of the best evidence to scientifically satisfy the question, how did living things come to be so varied and so complicated? Charles Darwin was never aware of Mendelian genetics or the code hidden in the nucleus of our cells, but the tale they tell is of utmost importance in supporting and proving his amazing theory of evolution. I have two basic reasons that caused me to choose today's topic. The first is, it's really a fascinating topic. And the second is, it's really a fascinating topic. So, uh, we want to leave things open. Hmm. 
I'm not uh, getting a change. There it is. Thank you. Uh, during this talk, your questions and comments can be sent to tscott at humanistchat.org, or you can use Google Hangouts to chat your questions to us live. Scott's monitoring his phone here, and we'll be able to read and answer your questions during the talk. So, we're talking about evidence here. Evidence is a funny thing. Imagine you had a discussion with a friend who never heard that America bought a large portion of its current landmass from Napoleon Bonaparte in 1803. Never happened, she says. You do a little research. 828,000 square miles, you say. Portions of 15 current states and two future Canadian provinces. Don't believe it, is the reply. America only sought to purchase New Orleans and its adjacent coastal lands, you go on. But at the price offered by France, who was burdened by war debt, Thomas Jefferson's negotiators accepted this vast offer for 50 million francs and a cancellation of debts worth 18 million more. This is around $250 million in today's money. Not much for all that area of land. You show copies of documents, like this map. You show articles from history books and periodicals. You can even show paintings made at the time. Then you take her on a visit to New Orleans. You see the preponderance of French cuisine, French language still in use today, French names on roads and buildings and natural features. The amount, this amount of knowledge and information would convince almost all people of the truths in your original statement. It'd be a very stubborn person indeed to continue in their erroneous beliefs after so many facts. So we hope to bring you facts to help support our point of view. In the same way, our body carries information that convincingly supports evolutionary facts. Let me tell you a few today. First, I think we should review some of the amazing things science has learned about living bodies. Again, most all of what we are going to review right now was not known or even suspected by Darwin or people of his time a brief 175 years ago. Our bodies, as well as those of all living things, are made up of cells. You can see the nucleus, the cytoplasm, the ribosomes we'll talk about later, all the different parts of a typical animal cell there. You may not know there are roughly speaking 37.2 trillion cells in any human being. Almost every one of these cells has a nucleus, and in any nucleus is contained all the information that you need to build another you. Human cells contain, in the nucleus, 23 chromosome pairs. And on those chromosomes reside the genes that carry the coded information your cells use to manufacture all the structures in your body. Like I say, this is things that are probably a review for many of you, but this is wild information to somebody from Darwin's time. Now, if unwrapped, the spirally wound chromosomes in one cell would stretch six and a half feet long. That's as long as Paul's cell now, from one cell. I hope you're here today, Paul. All the chromosomes in your body unwrapped would stretch to twice the diameter of the solar system. That's a potential for a lot of information kept in your body. This information is kept on the famous double helix found by Rosalind Franklin, James Watson, and Francis Crick. DNA, the famous abbreviation of deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA consists essentially of long strands of coded instructions that specify the order of each cell's manufacture of proteins. It tells the cell how to manufacture proteins. Proteins, in, in then, are the molecules that do all the work in every organism, from carrying oxygen to building tissue, to copying DNA for the next generation. DNA is made of two strands of four distinct bases, They're shown on the right on this view here. 
These chemical building blocks are represented by the single letters A, C, G, and T. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. The two strands are held together by strong chemical bonds between pairs of bases that lie on opposite strands. A always pairs with T, and C always pairs with G. DNA text is written like this, just long, long strands of coded protein level uh, knowledge, base pairs, one after the other, excuse me, one after the other, for hundreds and hundreds of pages if it would be written down in a book. The proteins are made up of building blocks called amino acids. Each amino acid is encoded as a triplet ACA, let's say, or GTT, etc. 400, on average, amino acids assembled in a chain specify a protein. The length of DNA that codes for a protein is called a gene. So you can see on this slide that the first three make uh, the, the codes so that, that codone there makes alanine. And then the next three combine to make the next protein, and so on as you work your way down the line glutamate, leucine, and so on. And then you can see at the end, there's actually a codone, a three, uh, three, paired, three, three pieces of a pair that make a stop segment, okay? So this is a schematic of how it, how it represents, at least, a good way to think about it. There are 64 different triplet combinations of A, C, G, and T. You can combine all those four in 64 total ways, but there's only 20 total amino acids in this universe. Multiple triplets code for certain amino acids, and three triplets code for nothing and act as a stopping point for protein manufacture. So all this has evolved in our cells. So I have a question. Would you say that these codes, AGA, TCC, etc., are the same or different between different species? Can a scientist examine a string of code and tell what organism is being investigated? Would the codes be more similar in similar species, let's say apes and baboons, than they are in differing species, redwoods and cardinals? Actually, they are, with very minor exceptions, the same in every living thing, plant, animal, or bacteria. It's amazing. That is why bacteria can be used to produce human proteins for pharmaceutical use, such as insulin, for example. This slide shows a human pancreas cell and the part uh, an insulin producing gene can be taken out of that, added on to a bacteria DNA, which has an area removed from it to allow for this part to be inserted, so that's called recombinant DNA and that goes on to make a bacteria cell that can then produce insulin. Almost all the insulin used today is produced and uh, manufactured and, and sold and used, uh, made, from, made from bacteria. If this wasn't true, if evolution and natural selection wasn't true and we were all completely different creatures made up of all different types of codes and, and so on, this couldn't be done. Going back to that list of all the DNA text, another item of importance to note is that a large portion of this DNA is what scientists call non-coding. It doesn't direct the cell to make a protein. It has been called junk DNA in the past, but scientists and researchers have been finding that at least portions of it have important functions beyond coding for protein manufacture. Some are triggers that initiate other areas of the chromosome to start or stop their work. There's a lot to be learned about DNA yet. The code carried in DNA is always subject to mutations. Any one of those little lines in there can be uh, replaced, changed, altered. So let's look deeper at that. 
Leucine is an interesting amino acid. It's common and used quite regularly as cells build large protein molecules. It is generally made by three bases, thymine, thymine, and adenine, T, T, and A. What might happen if one of the bases is changed because of a mutation in the DNA? If that T doesn't stay as a T anymore, but it's changed to some other code. The cell might not manufacture leucine anymore, and a significant change in the resulting program could be deleterious for the organism. So let's look. One possible thing is that it could mutate, and the A, the adenine, could change to guanine. It still makes leucine as the amino acid. Another possibility, if the first of the codons changes, if the first pair changes, it's still leucine. You can even have double mutations. The first and the last, the T changed to C and the A changed to T and you still have leucine. These are other double mutated triplets. CTC is still leucine and even CTG. So there are six different ways, and if a mutation occurs, the potential is that the cell can go on still pro uh, making, producing the same amino acid, still producing the same proteins, the same molecules, and doing the same function in the, in the cell as it needs to do. So that's a safety feature that's built in in some ways. In fact, there's a lot of safety features built in, too. The next slide emphasizes strongly one of the most important points that I want you to realize today. I almost said, go home with. <laughs> but I want you to realize it today. You're probably home already. This is a lot of information on here. But this is the conservative nature of natural selection. As I implied earlier, leucine can go through quite a few different changes in its DNA structure and still be the same protein. So if you look at, there are 64 possible triplets, like ACG, TTC, because there's four possibilities for the first codon, or the set, uh, four position, or four possibilities for the second place, and four possibilities for the third place. That's four times four times four. There's 64 possible variations. And for any triplet, there are three possible changes at each base. So because it's an adenine, it can change to one of the other three, thymine, cytosine, or guanine. So there's three plus three plus three is nine total changes for any triplet. So if there's 64 triplets and nine potential changes for every triplet, there's 576 different possible random mutations that can occur in just one amino acid. The genetic code reveals that 135 mutations have no impact, like we talked earlier. Leucine can have a few changes in its, in its uh, structure, and its base, one of its bases, and not change. So they call that synonymous, and this is 23% of the 576. So roughly 23% of times those mathematically possible changes in the mutations can occur and it'll have no impact at all. It'll still make the same protein. By subtraction, that means that 77% are non-synonymous. They do have an impact. 77% of the time, if there's a mutation, there's going to be a change in the protein produced. This mathematically is a ratio of 1 to 3, really 23% to 77%, which is very close to 1 to 3. So if we just stay to 1 to 3, that means that of every time that there's a change that has no impact in making a protein, there's going to be three mutations that would have an impact, and you'd have some potentially deleterious effect. So three times as many times a change mathematically makes an, uh, a non-synonymous uh, uh, changing type of uh, impact on the protein. But in nature, if you look in nature, we find a ratio synonymous to non-synonymous of 3 to 1. In other words, 
when you look at things out there, and when you look at actual cells of structures of animals, of living organisms, there's many more times, three times as many times, the change didn't make any impact. Well, why would that be? It's a tenfold more common end result of no change than change. Ten times as often as you'd expect by mathematics, the change doesn't make any change in the protein. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. No, it's not. <laughs> so why is that? I'd like to give you some time to think about it. Why would it be that ten times as much as you'd expect mathematically is there no change and the cell just keeps going on just as it always has? Any answers on the live feed? No. Everybody's still thinking. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, the reason why is that most times when a, when a change comes that affects and makes a change in the protein level, that will more often than not be deleterious, be, be damaging. And that would not result in a viable organism, and it wouldn't be out there in the world to be checked. So the reason that there's 10 times as many good results is because, as you'd expect, is because natural selection, right? So it's a good proof that natural selection actually occurs when you go that much away from mathematical supposition, or mathematical calculation. It's like something's filtering. For it. Right. It's, it's filtering out things that would be deleterious and making sure that things that aren't deleterious, they have no reason not to survive. Their, off, their forebears and ancestors have survived for years with that kind of protein, so they have a very likely chance, a very good likelihood of surviving. But if you make changes, changes can be bad. So, very important thing, natural selection, like I said, I want you to take it home with you today, has a very conservative impact. Okay. It's a very conservative function. It conserved what has worked well for an individual. It rids an organism of most changes that would compromise its survival. I don't think I can overstate this conservative purifying aspect of natural selection enough. Most mutations are bad, and natural selection ensures that bad mutations don't survive. Mike, you said it rids an organism. Does it rid an organism or a species of bad uh, mutations? I think, in my mind, it rids an organism. That organism doesn't survive, and it can't pass on its genes to its species, so it does it purify. That's true. If an organism has a bad mutation, it either won't be able to, uh, to survive itself or it most likely won't be able to pass on its bad traits to uh, its offspring. So I think it, does, it doesn't change that offspring or it doesn't change that individual, that organism. It, it is what it is, right? What its proteins have created. And if it survives, it may live on, uh, but it, it tends to rid the species that that group of it. So for every one mutation that has no impact, three mutations occur that do have an impact in that original mathematical model. Okay. Certain genes give an important clue to the certainty of the interrelatedness of all life. Cells have reproduced in much the same way for billions of years. This is a human gene made by a string of amino acids represented by the letters shown. Each of those stands for a different code for a different amino acid. 26 amino acids in this exact arrangement tell human cells how to elongate to make ribosomes. You have this gene, I have this gene, all humans have this gene. But in a similar way, tomatoes have to elongate their ribosomes in order to produce, in order to reproduce too. How similar do you think the string of, ama of amino acids is in a tomato? Remember, each of those amino acids is made up of three of the base units. So that's 26 times three, quite a few things in there. How many of these amino acids would, would be changed in a tomato? Make, guess a number. 
The answer is one, that final one. All the, all the rest are the same. So this tomato cell uses very similar pattern to make ribosomes elongate in its cell as humans do too. How about in yeast? Yeast is a lot different than a human. One more, only one more. You can see it about fourth from the end. 24 amino acids the same and two separate, two different in yeast. Archaea, billions of years old structure. Five more. It's interesting that they seem to be towards the, the end of the code instead of the end. Uh, bacteria, maybe. Bacteria, six further changes. So, of these 26 amino acids, behold, an immortal gene. 14 amino acids have stayed the same for more than three, possibly four billion years from all living things, from bacteria to humans. Those are immortal genes. This again reemphasizes the conservative nature of natural selection. Ribosomes need to be elongated in all living things to continue life. Essentially, similar tactics are used by all organisms to achieve that function with very minor changes. Immortal genes. <clears throat> so I'm going to have to explain this next display to you. This is the best display of this that I could, that I could get, so bear with me. If the AV people can zoom in on the slide, that would be helpful. There are screenshots of a fairly sophisticated, these are screenshots of a fairly sophisticated method for comparing the chromosomes of different individuals. The scientist here was involved in looking for common elements in the chromosomes of different primates. Up on the top, it's not easy to see, it says owl monkey, green monkey, siamang, orangutan, gorilla, chimpanzee, bonobo, and human. Okay, so that's up along the top, and then as you look downstream down along that, you see uh, patterns that are made by investigating and looking for markers on the chromosomes of each of those animals. Okay. You can see results banded together for an owl monkey, a green monkey, and all those different parts there. We should start at the bottom. If you can see on the left, it says E, row E. And this shows a chromosome marker that the great apes all have, but it isn't seen in most of the monkeys. You can see that band of light across all the things, humans, bonobos, chimps, gorillas, orangs, and even the siamang. Here's a siamang, by the way, if you aren't sure of what that is. They uh, brachiate. They swing through the trees, jumping 30, 40 feet. They also are very loud animals, but just so you're aware of what a siamang is. So in, in row E, there are common genes that were introduced hundreds of millions of years ago and have been in the evolutionary line of primates ever since. I think I meant to say tens of millions of years ago, actually. Further up the display, we see a chromosome marker that is not seen on owl monkeys, green monkeys, and also siamangs. In row D, you see that there's a different chromosome marker there, and siamangs have dropped off and don't show this marker as well. On row C is more restriction of chromosomes to an even smaller group. Orangutans have fallen off that group. On row B, our common ancestor with chimps and bonobos exhibited this gene and passed it on to both of our kinds, us, humans, and chimps. We can also say that that gene was acquired sometime after gorillas and orangutans branched, branched off from the evolutionary line that led to humans. So you can see that the chimps, bonobos, and humans only have that chromosome marker at row B. 
Finally, at row A is a gene specific for only humans. Now, I hasten to add that there are similar genes specific to orangutans, siamangs, and all the primates listed here because each of these species has gone on to evolve and speciate through natural selection, not just humans. It's not that they have less genes than we do. Their genes went in different ways, and you could find genes that are their chromosome markers for siamangs that allow them to have that howling capacity or the long, strong limbs and so on that humans don't have. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later, too. But further work in this area, then, has led to an evolutionary tree of hominids presented rather simply here. The lines are a little bit light, but off on the left is the original common ancestor, and then the owl monkey broke off at a certain time, and all the others moved on because the owl monkey didn't have a certain chromosome that the rest kept. Green monkey uh, speciated, went off on its own at a certain time, and so on. The siamang, orangutan, gorilla, all of them have common ancestors, but the last common ancestor was a common ancestor for all of them, and then things, they started speciating from there. Once one of these organisms fails to display a certain gene, it is important to note it marks an evolutionary divergence between that species and the others that still display this common gene. That is a point where the species without that gene, let's say the siamang, moved on an evolutionary path while the rest of the organisms in the group diverged, later experiencing a mutation in their common ancestor that was a benefit to them in some manner. The importance of this is that these gene patterns give evidence of a divergence from a common, a common up until then, evolutionary path. Both species evolve. This just shows where their paths split away from a last common ancestor. Are there any questions? Not yet. You're doing a great job. <laughs> okay. So that was a discussion of of immortal genes, important topic. Another important topic for, day, for today is the concept of fossil genes. A fossil gene is a non-functioning set of base pairs on a chromosome. Why do they function no longer? Generally, a mutation occurred, and the proteins that were supposed to be coded for and therefore made cannot do that any longer. If that gene is essential to an organism's existence, natural selection takes over and that individual dies. If an, organi if an organism sur survives, evidently, kind of going to what Scott was asking earlier, that gene is no longer essential to that individual and therefore not to that species. So sometimes you can have a mutation that makes a change that isn't deleterious, it isn't essential, that it used to be the way it was, and so therefore that species can continue, that individual can continue, and so can the species. The species goes on, the protein is no longer made, but the history of that gene is still in the structure of the chromosomes that remains in that body. Do you see why it would be called a fossil? A species goes on, but it carries with it the remnants of the genes that no longer are needed. Let's look a little closer. I'm using some... Uh, puns off the word optics and so on. Opsins are a group of proteins in our body that take light stimulus and convert it into an electrochemical stimulus that our brain can recognize. Humans have three opsins, opsins that allow us to see the basic colors of red, green, and blue. Millions of years of evolution has performed a spectral tuning on humans and also on every other light sensing species. That is why we see differently than insects, birds, and even other mammals. The opsins in our eyes are most impacted by certain wavelengths of light. But a dolphin, for example, lives in another world. What colors are of least importance to a dolphin of those three? Red, green, blue? Blue, as it turns out, and I would imagine that you could possibly see why. Let's inspect how this has impacted the genetic structure of dolphins. I'm going to use a cow opsins as comparison. Cows are closely related to dolphins. Millions of years ago, both their ancestors lived on land, 
But dolphins' forebears long ago returned to the sea. They claimed a niche in the ecosystem of the time. Many things changed for the ancestors of dolphins, but I want to concentrate on their vision. Cows have the capacity to see in shades of blue, and here is the expression of the gene that allows that. And if you don't believe that, you can ask any cow. They'll support this. So here's the gene that allows cows to see blue. In, the, in dolphins, who have minimal capacity to see blue, but they do have an opsin that's very similar to this. There's the dolphin's opsin. Do you see that there's some missing parts in there? It's mutated and actually it's non-functional. So they can't see blue because they're working with a non-operational and non-functional remnant of the opsin gene. Missing bases throw off the three base at a time decoding of the gene's text and it shifts the reading frame and makes the gene non-functional. All dolphins and whales have a fossil opsin gene. So you're saying the gene is, is still there, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything? It doesn't get uh, translated into a protein or anything? It just, it just hangs around in the DNA? Right, right. In the length of that chromosome, just because something is mutated doesn't mean it disappears. Its remnants remain. Things are blasted away by radiation or whatever comes along or just chance and they lose certain base pairs, yet what remains, it remains. And it's non-functional, it cannot make the, the opsin for the uh, dolphin to see blue. But why is the dolphin alive still? It doesn't need to see blue. Blue is not an important vision use in there. So it's kind of that if you, if you uh, don't use it, you lose it kind of thing with uh, evolution too. I've so, heard that there's the same kind of thing related to humans in our sense of smell, that we have a lot of uh, genetic mutations that inhibit what would otherwise be a very much more acute sense of smell. There are many, we're, we're going to be talking about fossil genes in humans in just a minute. Cool. <laughs> All right. In fact, here is another fossil gene that's a little closer to home, the MYH16 myosin muscle gene. It's associated with the development of the jaw muscles related to chewing. It shows up in macaques like this. It's also found in gorillas, exactly the same. Chimps, the same. And they, that's all moving towards humans in the evolutionary pathway. Do you think that we have some of that structure in our system? Sure. Here's what we have in ours. Here's that gene in humans, missing elements. As humans developed, one mutation was this, causing us to have weakened jaw musculature. Imagine what could have been. Something like this, maybe. <laughs> so there's the development of the muscular jaw in the gorilla, and humans attempt to be able to crack open the final few pistachio nuts in the bag by science. So a big change in our whole facial structure came along because there was a mutation to the gene that creates large, large jaw structures. Here's another one, nocturnality in mammals. Hey, I have a, a comment from online. OK. Uh, it says, when I ask a, a question, they're having trouble hearing it. So uh, if you think it's a good question, repeat it into the mic. OK, OK. Nocturnality in mammals. Why are certain animals nocturnal? Scientists would say because they fill an evolutionary niche. There's an opening there that allows them to thrive, and so certain animals become nocturnal. But that makes a lot of demands upon a body to change to allow itself to thrive in a nocturnal environment. I've got a few nocturnal creatures on the next slide, 
The owl monkey is the only nocturnal animal among higher primates. And its SWS opsin gene, which is the same as what we're talking about with, um, with dolphins and cows, it's also non-functional. So do you think it has the same mutations as the dolphins? It's on the top left. Those are owl monkeys in the top left. So it has a mutation, and it's non-functional. Do you think it has the same mutation as the dolphins or a different mutation? And the answer is, it has a different mutation because it mutated much later in time. It didn't mutate at the same time as the dolphin mutation occurred. So those were chance mutations that occurred at different lengths of time. It would be just uh, an immense chance for that to actually occur, that it would be the same mutation. They had a mutation that has the same effect, but it was probably a different, uh, a different uh, base on the, on the gene structure. So the next point is nocturnal prosimians, which are lemurs, tarsiers, bush babies, and lorises. And I've got some examples of them here. On the top right is that cute slow loris. And on the bottom left are bush, is a bush baby. You can see nocturnal evidence there. Their opsin gene has a big chunk of code missing. Would you hypothesize that it's a similar amongst each of those prosimians? So each of those tarsiers, lemurs, bush babies, and lorises all have a big chunk of code missing. It's possible that it's all the same code that's missing, or it's possible that it's different. And the most likely possibility is that it's the same code because they're so similar in structure that at some point their last common ancestor lost that chunk of code and then pass that on to all these other different uh, animals, these prosimians that were all uh, descendants. descendants from that creature, yeah. So there's a last common ancestor kind of issue involved there. The last one is the blind mole rat on the bottom right. You can see that blind mole rat has very, you, cannot, you can't see any evidence of eyes on it, although anatomically, they're tiny, barely functional eyes that cannot detect images and are located entirely under the skin, and it's covered by a layer of fur. What's the potential purpose of that? So the purpose of the barely functional eyes, scientists believe, is to maintain a biological clock for the animal. It can see when it's daylight out, it can see when it's night, it can image things. Uh, natural selection is still working on these genes. They're still there, or they would have dis disappeared long ago. You can tell that it's essential because it's still there. In a way, that seems to have regressed because uh, if you look at the evolution of the eye, a simple sensing of light versus dark was a key step in the evolution of light sensitivity. So they've almost gone backwards. Right, They're, they've lived in an environment in which light was not important to them to much of an extent, so they never emphasize that. And we'll see that in a little bit too as you talk about the olfactory issues. In more formal terms, fossil genes are exactly what we would predict to evolve as a consequence of the continuing action of mutation over time in the absence of natural selection. If it doesn't cause you to die out as a creature, you still go on, you still continue. So fossil genes will remain in bodies and, and we can find them in all bodies as natural selection has not caused something to need to be kept, right? Like the jaws of, of humans, we don't need the big musculature, so it's gone away, the, the uh, protein doesn't get manufactured anymore, we don't manufacture those large jaws, but there's remnants of that in there. So fossil genes, very important other thing. Fossil genes are the marks of changes in lifestyle from those of ancestors. And when we can spot and track fossil genes, these are valuable clues to reconstructing natural history. It can kind of show the less need for humans to have large jaws, massive jaws, and the less need of dolphins to see blue. 
So, some fun facts. Of 25,000 mammalian genes, by far the largest family of genes are olfactory receptor genes, things that allow mammals to smell. Early on, when, when the only mammals were scrabbling around in the forests at night trying to keep away from, uh, from big dinosaurs and pterodactyls and so on, smell was very important for them to find their food and to keep safe. Mice have 1,400 olfactory receptor genes, an immense amount of genes just for smelling in one small critter. Human olfactory genes, not so much. 50% of our olfactory receptor genes are fossilized and non-functional, 50%. When and why did this happen? Let's look into that. Here's some clues for you. Mice, lemurs, am I saying that right? Lem I heard lemurs. Lemurs, mice, lemurs, New World monkeys have 18% of their olfactory uh, receptors fossilized. So they still use less than what their original uh, common ancestor used. Old world monkeys and colobus, 29% fossilized. <clears throat> Non-human apes, orangs, chimps, gorillas, 33% fossilized olfactory receptors. And as I said earlier, humans, 50% fossilized. So what's going on with that? Why is it that this is re recessing less and less effectiveness of the olfactory receptors. What humans, can you tell me what humans and non-human apes have that the first two categories of mammals don't have? And the answer to that, one answer is full color vision. How would full color vision affect olfactory receptors? I think the speculation is that as you come to depend more upon vision and being able to tell a ripe leaf from a, or a ripe fruit or a perfect leaf to eat from a less ripe version, vision helps you quite a bit. If you have color vision, you can tell the ripe fruit easily. So. In a summary, immortal and fossil genes provide conclusive evidentiary support for Darwin's theory of evolution by randomness and natural selection. Even though Darwin had no idea of genetics or the structure and mechanics of chromosomes, genes, DNA, amino acids, proteins, and cell growth, he knew virtually nothing about any of those topics, yet all these provide conclusive evidence his thoughts about evolution were, were correct. Immortal and fossil genes support that all living things are descended from one common ancestor. You can see it in their gene structure. The fossil genes and the immortal genes are both great indicators that living things all came from a common ancestor. Immortal and fossil genes help clarify the evolutionary paths of all living things and specify how evolution progressed. That's been something in the last 40, 50 years that has just cleared up many questions in the evolutionary uh, ladder of life. And they clarify why and how unhelpful traits are lost. So there's a lot of immortal and a lot that immortal and fossil genes do to identify the structure of life, to help us understand it, and to help us fit in and try to understand it better in our world. That's it for me. I'm happy to take any questions or thoughts or try to uh, bring any clarity to it in areas that I've missed or didn't cover well. But thanks so much for coming to Science Sunday, and uh, the crowd goes wild.
stay well. <laughs> and stay well out there. So one thing. Uh, Maybe come on up here. One thing I was thinking about is that uh, the, the way that the vision versus the olfactory genes have um, progressed through the evolutionary record and the record of different species lends credence to the argument that a sense of smell, being able to identify molecules, uh, important molecules in your environment, that is a more primitive uh, capability than color vision. Right, because we seem to have acquired color vision relatively later in the evolutionary history than uh, uh, corresponding with losing the ability to smell. And there's other evidence aside from just the olfactory genes. Let me, let me respond to that a second. Yeah. To my mind, I think dogs would have a big argument with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> because I think that each organism advances in its own way and evolves in its own way. Dogs are don't have color vision, yet they have this amazing capacity of smell. They're used, obviously, in many ways. Maybe they can smell out coronavirus if, they, if we work on them and develop, and de develop that. So in our evolutionary path, we evolved towards, uh, well, we didn't evolve towards anything. We evolved in random ways, and then things happened. But in part of our evolutionary path was the acquisition of color sensitivity. So it's all about survival. You can either do it with eyes, you can do it with noses, or you can do it with a combination. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, that's a, I was trying to be careful when I was talking about the different animals, and we're seeing that, like, well, this animal, the owl monkey, doesn't have this capacity anymore. And that's not a very scientific way to look at it, because they have evolved since the time that they split off from, the, from that point, too. And they've evolved their great strengths. The siamangs, if you look at that on, the, on YouTube, they have these brachiating capacities. They swing through the trees, and they can fly 40 feet through the trees and grab onto the next branch and so on. So there's a lot of capacity that they have that they would consider themselves much more advanced, and we're very primitive because we've gone towards color vision. Yeah. You know? So We do have a question online. Uh, are there other animals that have full color vision that you know of? Is it just mammals or birds, reptiles? Well, and even full color vision, you know, maybe we're being a little bit uh, provincial when we say we have full color vision. Insects and, and many birds have vision in areas that we don't have at all. You know, there's uh, infrared vision that they see. If you look at, at some birds and some insects under infrared light, you see some amazing um, uh, capacities that they are actually displaying not in the colors that we see them in but they're displaying in other colors so we call ourselves full color you know but we have options that are graded at three wavelengths that we feel are full color because we're evaluating it based on our own data um, other animals see in many other colors insects and birds being among them um, and and I know that there's a difference between the old world monkeys and the new world monkeys the, uh, the old world monkeys retained color vision and the new world monkeys actually lost color vision after the continent separated long ago. The question was from Steve R. Steve R. Thanks, Steve R. Um, I know I'm getting the signal. We got about a minute left. Uh, I really appreciate all the efforts of everyone. Steve Cooper up in the audio visual booth and uh, this was a lot of fun. It's it's odd speaking to an empty crowd, um, but I felt the support of a lot of people behind me. So thanks a lot. Uh, it's a Science Sunday. Uh, with everything going well, we'll be back here in two weeks with Scott Thompson's talk about origins. And keep safe out there and uh, wash your hands and, and keep, keep yourself uh, healthy. All right. Thanks. thanks.